Next week's going to be a little bit messy, so let's talk about the announcements. Um, you have classes on Sunday and Monday, this class, and maybe some of your other classes too, I don't know. But uh, the way it's going to work is we'll have class in here in the computer lab on Sunday and on Monday. For Monday, you need to upload your project to iLearn by 5 o'clock, and also I'm giving you until 5 o'clock to finish the homework if you need the extra time. If you've got it finished in class, of course, I'll accept it then. But if you'd like a few extra hours, then you can make the long walk up to the third floor of the main building and turn in your paper to my office by 5. Okay? Uh, if I happen to be out, when you stop by, just slide your paper under the door. Today we're going to continue talking about break-even analysis. Before we do that, are there any questions related to the announcements? Okay. Remember last time when we talked about break-even analysis, we were acknowledging the fact that there's a relationship between price and demand. What happens when you lower the price? Demand goes up, right. The book doesn't get into that kind of detail. The book really has a uh, simplification that demand is unlimited or that maybe one company isn't going to satisfy the demand in the market. So with that simplification in mind, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today is a different view on break-even analysis when you're not acknowledging the fact that prices change along with demand. Remember, we talked about two kinds of costs, fixed and variable. The fixed costs are the ones that are unaffected by our level of productivity. If you have salaried employees, it doesn't matter if your factory is making 1,000 units per year or 10,000 units per year. Those salaried employees, like the managers, are getting paid the same amount. Now, the hourly employees, for example, are directly affected by the level of productivity. If your company is doing overtime shifts and working on the weekends and in the evening, then your labor costs are going to be variable and they're going to be going up the more activity you've got. But other things like rent, insurance, capital recovery, all of those things are considered as fixed, whereas the variable costs may be material costs, shipping, warranty, and so on. Why do you suppose that warranty expenses for a company is affected by the level of production? What is it? Remember, a warranty is basically when you buy an item, maybe if, if it breaks within one year, then the company will replace it for free. So why are the, com the production company's warranty costs tied to their level of production? Okay, that's possible that uh, if they produce more, there might be more errors, but it's even simpler than that, actually. It's just, yes? That's right. Yeah, the more items they make, the more items that they have under coverage. Right, so it may not be their warranty cost per unit that's going up, but just the total number of units in circulation has increased. All right, so the book provides two different ways of looking at costs. So one is a linear relationship. In this linear relationship, it's saying that we've got some fixed cost that's unaffected by our quantity of production. And then there's the variable costs, the blue line. The variable costs are going up because uh, the more you make, the higher your variable costs. That's a simplification that really uh, isn't true. In most cases, we'll have a nonlinear cost relationship. And so this nonlinear cost relationship what it says is the more you're making, the flatter the variable cost curve is getting. Why? Why is the variable cost curve flattening out as production levels increase? Can you think of an instance where that might be the case? Why? What are the factors that could cause the uh, nonlinearity that's pictured? Yusuf. Okay, that's definitely one of the effects is uh, the learning curve. The more they make, the better they get at, at doing it. So I think I agree. That's one of the factors. Is there another one that could account for the flattening of this variable cost curve? Yes? Maybe 
Okay, that could be it. That uh, when you're making more, uh, a few, when you're making a lot, the cost of a few more, the marginal cost is getting lower. Right. So if, take for example the materials expenses. If you're buying components for an electronics item, if, if you're going to make 10,000 cell phones and you're buying screens, probably they have, the screen manufacturer has one price if you buy 10,000, but if you buy uh, 100,000, the price per unit is decreasing. And so there could be bulk discounts associated with material costs as well. Here's another figure from the text that's a little bit complicated, and so let's step through it one piece at a time. Uh, what we have here are two different curves. We have a revenue curve, R, and then our total cost curve. We're starting with the black line. One of the simplifications in the book is that um, our revenue curve is not actually, it, it's flat because uh, th in the textbook they don't consider decreasing price affecting demand. So if we have a flat revenue curve, <coughs> what that means is that in this instance there's only going to be one break-even point. The break-even point is where the costs and the revenue are equal. Here, since the revenue curve isn't starting to go down again, then there isn't a second break-even point. And that's fine. We can deal with that assumption. What this illustration is showing is, what if your variable costs go down? So this lower blue line is basically, what if you got a discount from a supplier? Maybe some of your labor costs decreased, or your uh, variable cost for materials goes down. So now, if you have a lower cost curve, what that does is it shifts the break-even point to the left. The intersection point between your cost and your revenue is at a lower production quantity than it was before. And so the text provides this formula for calculating the break-even point when you have a linear relationship between demand and revenue. And it has to do with the fixed cost, the revenue per unit, and the variable cost per unit. And in the previous lecture, we called variable cost per unit lowercase c sub v. Here, the text is just using the lowercase v as the variable cost per unit. So basically, the, uh, the relationship that this figure is illustrating is that if your cost curve goes down, then it shifts the break-even curve to the left. Yeah? Yes, that's right. Revenue per unit is the same thing as price. Here's the, me, the, the main thing for today, comparing alternatives. When we're comparing alternatives, we're going to do that on a cost basis. We're not looking at profit or revenue, because when we're comparing alternatives, we assume that whatever these two alternatives is making uh, have equivalent quality and equivalent price. So we're only comparing the differences, and the difference between two pieces of equipment may be the costs. Now here we have two alternatives, alternative one and alternative two, and you can see that one of them has a cheaper first cost, or in other words, a cheaper fixed cost. Alternative one has the fixed cost that's lower. Maybe it's a cheaper piece of equipment to buy initially, compared to alternative two, where the intersection with the y-axis is higher. So that fixed cost, in this case, is the purchase price of the equipment. However, one of the curves is steeper than the other one, and those are the variable costs. And so in this case, it looks like alternative one, although it's cheaper to purchase, operational costs are higher per unit produced. And so there becomes a point where those two curves intersect, and that's the break-even in terms of whether we should choose one versus the other. And so this, this break-even isn't talking about profit uh, it's not talking about the comparison between revenue and costs. Break-even here is just talking about uh, the difference between which alternative to select. And which alternative to select depends on how many items you're making. If we're going to make this many items, which alternative should we choose? If we are right here, should we choose alternative one or alternative two? One, because it has the lower costs. 
But if we're going to have a really high level of production, if we're to the right of the break-even point, what we want to do is choose alternative two, because we're able to cover the higher, uh, I'm sorry, alternative, yeah, alternative two. It's strange, they, uh, they have the blue line always be the lower one. So alternative two, when we're to the right of the break-even point, is the cheaper alternative, and that's the one that we want to select. So here, what we mean by break-even is the point of production or demand where the costs are the same. Any questions about this figure and what it's meant to illustrate? In today's in-class exercise, we're going to do a comparison between two alternatives. Here's the situation. A company that has a MAR of 9% is going to be selecting between option one, which is a computer-controlled piece of equipment, and option two, which is manually controlled. The computerized equipment costs more, and it lasts longer. Um, it has a higher output in terms of units per hour, and it has lower labor costs, and so it has a lot of advantages. It's more productive, it lasts longer, and the labor costs are lower. But it's more expensive to purchase initially, 2 million dirhams versus 1.3 million dirhams for option two. Um, so here's the process we're going to go through. I've provided a template on the reverse side of the paper. Start Excel and uh, set up the spreadsheet according to this template. Some of the information is given and you're going to have to calculate some of the other things using formulas. Start with an expected output of 1,000 units. Since in uh, step B, I ask you for a, an output of 1,000 units per year. So at the top of the spreadsheet here, everything is dependent on how many items you're making. So begin with 1,000 units. So fill the interest rate, the first cost, predicted life, salvage, salvage value, and so on. Okay, now here's an important thing. The uh, number of hours per year that the item has to be operated is dependent on the expected output and the productivity. So if you are making 1,000 items per year and you can do three items per hour, that tells you how many hours per year you have to operate the equipment. All right, so I'm going to let you get started on that. I have the solution and I'll be circulating around in case you've got questions. All right. I'm as I walked around it seems like people are uh, getting this one pretty well. Let's take a look at some of the components of the solution. If you have 1,000 items and you're making three per hour, then that means you need 333 hours. If you're making it 2.4 per hour, then this tells you how many hours per year the equipment needs to be in operation. All right? Okay, for the fixed cost, we're doing capital recovery. So that's payment function. This, this is the annual equivalent of how much it costs to purchase the, uh, the equipment. Yeah. It would be 1,000 divided by three. Excuse me? Yeah, right, because look at the units. And it t if it is uh, units per hour and we have 1,000 units, then you should divide. All right, capital recovery is going to be the payment function because that makes an annual series out of a present value and a future value. So you need to have negative amount for the cost and a positive amount for the salvage value. Okay, so the fixed cost capital recovery is just that payment function where we're using the 9% interest rate. N for the uh, computerized equipment is 10 years. The present value will be our first cost, and then the salvage value is the future value, all right? So we have our fixed cost for both equipment, 
The variable cost is simply the number of hours that the equipment is in operation multiplied by the labor cost. And so the total cost is the sum of the two. I've set up a conditional format so that it turns bold whichever one has the, uh, the lower cost, the least negative, is going to become in bold. So here's the answer for 1,000. If we have 3,000 items, you can see that then option one is cheaper if we have 3,000 items. The break-even point will be somewhere between the two. Peter, yeah. It may be because you don't have your costs as negative. Yeah. OK. So how do we find the break-even point? It's where the costs should be the same, right? So I'll just keep playing with this so many times, 2,999. And I'll spend all afternoon until I see that these two are equal, right? 2,998. It's getting closer. 2,997. Goal seek. How do I use goal seek when I don't know what the value should be? Because you have to have a target, right? Difference. Difference, right. I didn't put that on your template because I wanted to see if you could think of what to do. We want these two costs to be the same, and what that means is that the difference will be zero. And so here we have uh, a difference field. And with the goal seek, it's data, what if analysis, goal seek. The objective is that this cell should be zero by changing the output. 2,045.62 units will give us equal cost. You can see both of them are bold because the two values are equal. So that's break-even analysis when you're comparing equipment, when the two different options are breaking even, depends on how many uh, items your expected uh, level of productivity is. We are out of time, unfortunately. So let's just take one last look at these announcements. Remember, next week we're going to be in the computer lab back here for both of our classes. And uh, the homework and the project submission both are on Monday by 5 o'clock. Have a great weekend. Please remember to put your in-class exercise paper on the chair on your way out. And if you didn't already collect your homework, it's here on this chair.